This is Caring for Kids on News Talk 760 WJR. Presented by the Children's Foundation. And here's your host, President and CEO of the Children's Foundation, Larry Burns. Thanks, Mark. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Caring for Kids December. Uh, Our episode features a great lineup of guests who are all working hard to advance the health and the wellness of children and their families. Tonight, we're going to start with Dr. Stephen Bloom, a specialist in physical medicine and rehabilitation. Dr. Paul Thomas of Bloom Health DPC. And rounding out our guests will be the Oakland County Executive, Dave Coulter. It's all coming up next right here on Caring for Kids on the Great Voice of the Great Lakes, News Talk 760 WJR. It's Caring for Kids with Larry Burns. Welcome back, everyone. Welcome to Caring for Kids, December edition. In the studio is Dr. Stephen Bloom. Dr. Bloom is a specialist in physical medicine and rehabilitation and has been serving patients for over 25 years. Dr. Bloom is the current medical director of rehabilitation for the St. Joseph Mercy Hospital Rehab Department in Ann Arbor, where he is also the medical director of the concussion and brain injury programs. Dr. Bloom graduated from the University of Michigan uh, and then received his doctorate MD degree from Michigan State University. I get that right? That's right, yeah. Welcome to Caring for Kids. Thank you. It's, for, it's great to be here, Larry, and uh, it's a good time to be caring for kids during the It is, you season. know, and I don't know if you're aware that we're, uh, we bought a tractor for the uh, farm at St. Joe's. We, we love that uh, farm, yeah. as you know. It's a great farm. Yeah, Amanda Sweetman's got a wonderful mission of, of not only promoting health and nutrition uh, throughout the Ann Arbor and uh, Ypsilanti area, but that farm uh, really serves as a role of wellness for the entire hospital. The nurses, therapists, yeah. doctors, it's wonderful. That is great to hear. And we supported yeah. the tractor, but maybe more important, some uh, funding for programs to reach out to the community and kids and oh, teach them about vegetables and all the things yeah. that uh, Amanda does. She was a guest on this show Yeah, she's as well. great. Did she let you drive the tractor? Uh, she asked me to drive it, and I was afraid. Uh, but I got on it, and I wore her hat. Oh, well, that's that's with a, a bow tie. That is very <laughs> big reward for you. I, I haven't even got to ride the tractor. Yes, well, you know, we bought it for her, so she was being nice. All right, uh, her and David Ripple were there, and yeah, uh, great. he's he's a great guy too. So, um, tell us about the rehab programs at uh, St. Joe Mercy Hospital. Yeah, St. Joe Mercy uh, in Ann Arbor uh, is a uh, level one trauma uh, center, so it's a full service uh, rehabilitation center within a hospital. Uh, so it's very unique. Unique. We have the ability to take care of injuries uh, that are severe, all the way from um, severe traumatic brain injuries, mm. spinal cord injury, multiple trauma, to those that are mild, uh, perhaps uh, uh, more simpler concussions or joint injuries from sports and, and whatnot uh, that we can treat all the way through the hospital system. And then those patients are able to continue with outpatient uh, rehabilitation programs, and that's uh, where uh, my role comes in. Uh, we have uh, uh, different programs taking care of a variety of different injuries for uh, kids and adolescents all the way up into adults, uh, including specialized programs for concussion, sports injury, uh, multiple different types of injuries. Good. And we're talking with Dr. Steve Bloom from St. Joe's in Ann Arbor, uh, oversees all of the rehabilitation services. And the Children's Foundation has a key focus area in injury prevention. And we look at kids, just so you know, from zero through college. Correct. Uh, and so it's a pretty broad uh, array of Yeah, ages. I even know some kids older than that, too. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, and <laughs> that's okay. Yeah. So what injuries, uh, are there any, any injuries that are becoming more frequent uh, with, uh, with kids, maybe adolescents, young adults? Uh, and then maybe what preventative advice can we give them? and parents uh, about that. Yeah, you know, as we enter the winter season, of course, we're starting to ramp up for those common winter sports-related injuries. We see uh, lots of snowboarding, skiing injuries, uh, sledding injuries. So oftentimes injuries with kids are are, are seasonal, uh, depending on what's coming up. Sure, in the spring it might be more bikes. Yep, more bikes or more rollerblading. In the late summer and fall, of course, we move into uh, school sports injuries. Right. So oftentimes it's kind of cyclic as we go uh, through the year. And then it's also important from the kids. So 
you know, you really want to start with uh, with um, preventative um, um, health right at the adolescent infant level, making sure things are safe in the home right. in terms of safety gates for stairs. Um, safe sleep. Safe sleep, making sure that drugs and medications are out of the hands of these mm-hmm. little ones. Right. And then that carries up into the adolescent age and right. even the teenage sure. age. Uh, you know, one of the things that we've seen quite a bit recently, and we'll talk about later perhaps, mm-hmm. is uh, you know, the problem with medications such as opioids being in the home. And we really need to safeguard our homes to make sure that any medications that come from the hospital can't be accessed. You know, about 70% of patients who go through my, from home from a hospital have a prescription for a narcotic or an opioid. Mm-hmm. And we've certainly seen an increase of accidental overdose uh, in kids and, and even some of those medications being taken uh, to be used um, to party. And so it's very important that those medications are accounted for. Yeah, absolutely. And are there any... Um, now, in Ann Arbor, I don't know if uh, the scooters and stuff that you see in cities are prevalent, but have you seen any um, new, sort of new fads, if you will, of injuries based on what people are doing today? Yeah, absolutely. The powered scooters uh, that you're uh, seeing so popular um, that you could just pick up and rent or even own yourself to right. get around are very popular, uh, uh, particularly with the teenagers and the college level. Uh, and, of course, with these, we've seen a huge increase in injuries to the wrists elbows, shoulders, and concussion. Most people aren't wearing helmets. No, they I just, don't think I've ever seen anyone on a scooter like that with a helmet. No, no, and they're very fast. And some of the municipalities haven't figured out whether you can ride on sidewalks versus streets, and both carry with them risks. So we've been seeing a huge increase uh, in the Ann Arbor Ipsy area from injuries of this. In fact, I just saw one last week that was a combination of a concussion, a fractured uh, wrist, and a dislocated knee uh, on a very able body, athletic, uh, 18-year-old college student. Uh, really? so they off do a scooter? Us. Yeah, off a scooter. Uh, no, no cars involved. He, he just hit a pothole and went flying. Yeah, I, and I've seen it downtown Detroit, yeah. and, and yeah. it's kind of scary. So what would be some of the major preventative things? The obvious would be to wear helmets when you're on a bike or a scooter? Yeah, we recommend wearing uh, helmets all the time when on a bike or a scooter, uh, making sure you're wearing vi- very visible gear, uh, bright coats or perhaps uh, some sort of reflector, if you can do that. Uh, knowing where you're going to be riding is very important, too. Know the terrain. If you can avoid riding at night, that's very helpful, right. too. I would think so. Yeah. And so uh, before we talk about the, uh, the opioid situation, I want to get into that a little bit, but are there other, um, are there advances that, uh, that you want our listeners to know about in rehab for people that uh, that maybe a decade ago did not have the the type of uh of hope that they might now have because of progress you've made? Yeah, absolutely. I'm, uh, I'm with the uh, Brain Injury Association of Michigan, uh, which is a, a large organization that's a part of the, the, uh, a national organization that helps uh, support and uh, promote uh, research and care for patients with brain injury. Uh, now, that can be brain injury through the entire spectrum. Uh, so severe traumatic brain injuries from, say, uh, motor vehicle accidents mm-hmm. and, and things like that, all the way down to concussion, which is a, a less severe uh, brain injury in a lot of cases. And there's been a lot of research over the last 10 years on how to identify and diagnose these types of injuries, particularly in the concussive realm, and certainly a ton of research on prevention and treatment once these injuries have occurred. Uh, We do a lot of uh, concussion uh, over at St. Joe. Uh, We have a a concussion program, which is an outpatient multidisciplinary program. Uh, It includes physical therapists, occupational therapists, speech therapists, neuropsychologists, Mm -hmm. recreational therapists, and uh, specialists might like myself, physiatry. Uh, I'm a specialist in uh, brain injury medicine, so about half of my time is spent taking care of patients with brain injury and concussion. And uh, I think we've done a lot better in identifying concussion in our youth uh, once it occurs and to some degree preventing it. There's no way we can completely prevent concussions, but now that it's so popular in the media, people are recognizing it more, uh, making sure kids get out of play once they've sustained a concussion, and then following concussion protocols before we get them back to play. Yeah, and we're talking with Dr. Dr. Stephen Bloom from uh, St. Joe's Mercy in Ann Arbor, uh, leader of the rehabilitation department. Uh, so you read or hear a lot more about um, NFL players, college players, football, and now hockey and even soccer um, that have suffered from several concussions. Is there is there a way for a parent or a grandparent if 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 their child or grandchild has one concussion? Is that 
is that a signal to stop playing the sport or is there a way to determine when enough is enough? That's a question I get asked every day and there is no good test. Uh, there is no way to determine how many concussions are too many. Now, that being said, our brain has a capacity to deal with concussion and when it occurs episodically or, or a few number of times, it likely will not cause any long-term deficits. What we hear about in the NFL uh, it develops because of repetitive concussions uh, over the course of an athlete's career. Right. So this uh, CTE or chronic traumatic encephalopathy develops uh, from multiple hits. There's no evidence that that uh, develops after just a few concussions. What is important, uh, mm-hmm. particularly at the uh, uh, at the um, kid level, is that if a concussion occurs, that it's identified early, and that that uh, child is taken out of play or risk of contact. We do know that if a kid has another concussion before the first one's completely healed, they are at a much higher risk to have uh, worsened okay. symptoms or more prolonged symptoms. That's very, very clear. Uh, so once we identify it and we treat them through a concussion program right. like at St. Joe, then we can determine when they're safe to return back to play and then monitor for those signs once they go back. And that didn't happen in the past. That's correct. Oh, yeah, gosh. Just, you know, Larry, when you and I went yeah. to high school and played football, yeah, we, we, you, were, we were, we we were, were proud of our there. dangers. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So. Maybe that's how we ended up in the jobs <laughs> we're in. <laughs> uh, well, that's really important information, I no think, for question, people to... Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned the uh, Brain Injury Association of Michigan. Our very own Tom Constan, our trustee of the foundation, is uh, is the leader of that group. He's a great man. He is he, a great he, man. He's helped champion brain injury yes. uh, recovery and research in support yeah. in the state of Michigan yeah, for a long time. And, and so he was the one who brought up the fact that there's a there's a connection with the opioid crisis and brain injury. So uh, that kind of surprised me. Can you explain what that is? Yeah, it's something that we're just starting to recognize. In fact, I just did a lecture up in Lansing on this subject. Is you know we we know that there's an opioid epidemic. We know that there's uh, problems associated with the opioids, and we know that there's opioid use also in in youth that have to be looked at. But one of the things that is starting to become evident is that opioid use is likely leading to something we call acquired brain injury, a concussion or an accident in a car where you suffer traumatic, uh, severe traumatic mm-hmm. brain injury. You know, you, you, that, that's from trauma. Right. But opioid use in the long-term use or even high doses of overdose can lead to an acquired brain injury, which is a lack of oxygen that flows to the brain after opioids have been ingested. Uh, That might be an overdose that's non-lethal. In other words, a kid might take an Mm -hmm. opioid. They might have decreased breathing for a period of time. They may be uptunded or difficult to And then Narcom comes in and they feel like they're... All better, right? Right, but there's a period of time when they're lacking oxygen to the brain. We're starting to see more and more research, more and more literature that is showing that even um, uh, small amounts of opioids or uh, uh, doses of opioids that don't lead to death are probably causing this acquired brain injury. It's almost impossible to quantify. There is no MRI that Mm. shows it. There is no blood test that shows it. We have some um, research that's going to be coming out with PET scans and functional MRIs, which do show some of that damage. The most sensitive test we have right now is something called neuropsychologic testing, which is done by PhD neuropsychologists, which is looking at how the brain works. But even that has uh, some difficulties for identifying. Yeah. So the real issue here is education to, to, to kids parents, teachers, families, friends about the danger of using these opioids. They, they don't think there's going to be any issue with it. They don't even recognize sometimes that they're not getting enough oxygen to the brain when they're yeah, using Yeah, and if it. it happens more than once, it's probably doubles the chance of it impacting them forever. It is. And then it, it's even worse than that. We know that if a, a, a teenager uses opioids, they are more than twice as likely to become opioid dependent once they become adults. So whether that is a part of the addiction process or a part of the difficulty with the brain making the decisions on that, we don't know. But clearly, in, in kids who start using opioids recreational, they are much higher risk for becoming dependent yeah, on their adults. Well, that's important information for all of us to know. Well, Dr. Bloom, thank you very much for being on Caring for Kids. You're doing great work at St. Joe's. Uh, and I look forward to continuing the conversation. And uh, let's see if we can partner with you and our Children's Foundation. Absolutely. We're very uh, excited to be part of it and very uh, thankful for what you do at the Children's well, Foundation. Well, thank you. It's our pleasure and my honor to serve. So uh, that was Dr. Stephen Bloom of St. Joe's Mercy in Ann Arbor. Coming up next, we're going to hear from another doctor, Dr. Paul Thomas. 
about his unique approach to health care when caring for kids continues here on the great voice of the Great Lakes, News Talk 760 WJR. Welcome back to Caring for Kids on WJR, presented by the Children's Foundation. Welcome back, everybody. Larry Burns here, December Caring for Kids on WJR. And in the studio is Dr. Paul Thomas. Uh, Dr. Thomas is a board-certified family medicine physician practicing in Detroit. Uh, He practices in Plum Health DPC a direct primary care service that is the first of its kind in Detroit and Wayne County. Uh, And his mission is to to deliver affordable, accessible health care in Detroit and beyond. And it's unique, and we're going to find out more about it. Dr. Thomas is a graduate of the Wayne State University College of Medicine, where he is also a clinical professor. Uh, So he's teaching students, also brought a student with him. Yes. Uh, and so that you're spreading, uh, you're spreading the knowledge. And so, uh, Dr. Thomas, welcome to Caring for Kids. Thank you so much for having me on. Uh, we met on Mackinac Island yes, at the uh, uh, annual conference put on by the chamber, and uh, you were kind enough to take a photo of, of me and uh, Jill Nelson and Dave Coulter, and yep. here we are. So uh, <laughs> A very memorable moment. It was. It it's was. a beautiful day. It was a beautiful day. Um, Plum Health is all about prevention, wellness, and so tell our listeners all about that. Yeah, we believe that healthcare should be affordable and accessible, and a lot of people are kept out of the insurance-based system because the cost of care is so high. So we've lowered the cost of healthcare, and we've allowed people to be more proactive with taking care of themselves. So it's every day we have someone come in that says, I haven't been to a doctor in five or 10 years, because I'm scared about how much it's going to cost me. And now they have an understandable known cost for our services, and they come see us before things get worse. Yeah, absolutely. And that that is the preventative part. Um, and so medical school, um, obviously undergraduate school, how did you determine to be on this path personally for your profession? Yeah, you know, a lot of people graduate from medical school and residency and take a job with the hospital system, but um, doctors in that system have to see more and more patients in less and less time, that insurance-based system. And they end up only having about eight to 10 minutes with each patient, and it feels like you're shoehorning people with real problems and real concerns into a limited amount of time. And that's not what I wanted to do. I want to take care of people with enough time to adequately address all of their concerns and then have enough time to focus on some prevention and um, actually building relationships with people and enjoying my time with my patients. So that's why I chose this direct care model where my patients pay me directly, Mm -hmm. $10 a month for kids, and then it starts at $49 a month for adults where they can come and see me anytime they need to. They also have my cell phone number, so they can text or email me anytime they need to as well. And so um, I think you refer to them as members? Yeah, they're members of our practice. And so uh, tell us a little bit more about membership. Let's start with, since we're a Children's Foundation kid, so you mentioned it was $10 a month, I think, for kids. Yes. And what might a parent uh, get for that membership? Sure. You know, you have a doctor on call for you. You have my cell phone number. You can call or text anytime. It might be as simple as sending me a photo of a rash that came up, and I could walk you through that. Or it could be a concern about an ear infection or strep throat. You could call me about that, or I'd want you to come in right away to be seen for that, or any other situation. Or you have your well visit where you come in. We saw an 18-month-old child this morning for their well care visit and did the physical exam and went through all of their history and concerns and made sure they were meeting their developmental milestones and that's all included in that ten dollars a month for children Um, that's that's terrific now if somebody has um, insurance Mm -hmm. can they still be a member yes we see people who are uninsured underinsured and fully insured um, as long as you're willing to pay the ten dollars a month for kids for kids forty nine dollars a month for adults starting at that rate we're happy to see you. And so uh, let's go to the adult side now. So it's roughly $50 a month, the, the starting rate. And what, mm-hmm. what, are, what are the membership advantages for that? 
Yeah, you, again, you have me on speed dial. You can get at me anytime you need to. We also do in-house labs and medications for all of our patients. So let's say you want to check your cholesterol. You might get charged 100 or $120 at the hospital for a cholesterol panel. At our office, it's $6. Likewise, if you want to test yourself for uh, blood counts, those are $4 in our office and sometimes $100 at the hospital. And then let's say you came in to manage your blood pressure mm-hmm. and you're taking lisinopril. That lisinopril tablet might be $10 at the pharmacy for a one-month supply. At our office, it's one cent per pill. So your blood pressure medications now wow. cost 30 cents a month. Wow. And can you fill your prescription right at your office? Exactly. You walk out the door with the meds that you need. That you need. Wow, that, that in itself is unique. And then, you know, on the kid's side, uh-huh. you know, if you say you have a sick child who comes in, with strep throat, the last thing you want to do is go to the doctor and then go to the pharmacy. Right. We have the amoxicillin on our shelf. Right. I'm going to hand right it to away. you. On the, I'll mix it up for you in the office. I'll show you how to administer it. You can take it out with you. Yeah, and, and head home and hopefully get on to recovery. Exactly. We're talking with Dr. Paul Thomas, a family medicine physician who started uh, Plum Health, uh, which is a direct primary care um, service. Uh, and we're talking about what that service is and what membership is and uh, and so how's it going the, from a standpoint of uh, when I first met you, I think you were launching. Yep. Uh, and so it's uh, several months later, and uh, I've read a lot about what you're doing, and uh, and so how's it going? Yeah, we, we initially launched in 2016 as a house call practice, and then I had a small office in southwest Detroit. Uh, we started with about eight members in that space. We've now grown to about 580 members. 580 members. Mm-hmm. And each doctor has about around 500 patients because then we can give our patients, our members, our full-time and attention. So we hired a second doctor to help us with the demand and we moved into this larger office in Corktown at the corner of the former um, Tiger Stadium site. Okay, on the corner there. And you're, and you're having uh, a groundbreaking in the next week or so, correct? Exactly. We're going to have a little ribbon cutting. A ribbon cutting. A little it's celebration. Right. Yeah, you're already yeah. there, not a groundbreaking. Yeah. Uh, and so the Children's Foundation, you know, we're... Since we're an independent foundation, we're not affiliated um, beyond partnerships with a hospital. We, we support hospitals, but we support, we have 77 partners now in the community. Hmm. Most now are about uh, social determinants of health. Hmm. Since we're not embedded in a hospital, uh, we want to support programs that keep kids and young adults out of the hospital. Yep. We're really glad they're there mm-hmm. when you need them. Uh, but we want to do things that prevent them from being used as, particularly as primary care. As right. we all know, some ERs are used that way. Mm-hmm. And this, your plum uh, idea, your initiative seems to fit in right exactly into that, the social determinants of health. And what I've been told is roughly 80% of our health is dependent on our, more on our environment than our genetics. Is that something that you... Yeah, I would say that's fairly accurate. Fairly accurate. You know, your your zip code being a huge determinant of your longevity is just one ex- real world example of that. Uh, and so, uh, so I I hope to to be able to support uh, more programs that are based in the community. Uh, and Corktown is a community that we hope to get more involved in, and and hopefully we can do some things together uh, as you get um, acclimated there as well. Uh, and so what, what are you hoping uh, Plum Health is in, let's say, two, three, five years? Well, we want to continue to grow and bring on a new doctor, perhaps every year or a year and a half, to help meet the demand. As you may know, there's only 100 primary care physicians practicing in the community in Detroit for 600,000 residents. So that's one doctor for every 6,000 residents. And if you go, didn't no- know that. If you go north of 8 Mile into Oakland County... There's one primary care physician for every 600 residents. So there's a 10x disparity between Oakland County and Detroit in terms of primary care resources. So we really want to meet that demand of access and affordability for primary care services. And we start in Detroit because we believe that's where we can be the most impactful. Yeah, well, it certainly sounds like you are impactful. Is there anything else you want our listeners to know about um, membership or the service or, or... I guess maybe even more importantly, how can they get involved and how can they become a member? Yeah, if you want to become a member, you can go to our website. It's our uh, website is plumhealthdpc.com, and that DPC stands for Direct Primary Care. 
And um, it's really important to have a family physician or a pediatrician that you see on a regular basis to help you manage uh, your health and your wellness um, and enact a preventive care plan and meet concerns when you need them. Um, a lot of people are relying a lot on urgent cares or ERs for their primary care services, and we believe that if you have a trusted physician that you can go to, um, you can leave, live a healthier life. Absolutely. And so, uh, last question, if, if, uh, if I were a member and I came to see you and you said, Larry, you need to go see a specialist, then you have a network of people that you're going to refer to as well, correct? Yeah, and one tool that we have, which is really cool, is a e-consult platform. So we can take up all of your health history details and write a consult to an endocrinologist or an orthopedist or a dermatologist, and it's at no charge to you. So it helps me expand my scope of care, and they respond to us within 4 to 12 hours usually, so we can get a really quick answer to the clinical question that you might have. Yeah, and that, that would include behavioral health or mental health as well? Exactly. And as a family physician, I've been trained uh, in psychiatry, and I help people with depression, anxiety, bipolar disorder, ADHD, etc. Yeah, that is a focus area of ours, too, that, uh, that we hope to take a real lead on. Uh, we feel we're taking a lead now, but we hope to do even more as a foundation over the next, uh, particularly in the Detroit area, in the next year or so. So Beautiful. stay tuned for that. So, uh, well, thank you very much for what you're doing. Thank you. Uh, and we'll uh, we'll keep an eye on uh, Plum Health and have you back, and you can tell us uh, how many more doctors you have in the next year. Thank you so much for having me. You're it's welcome. been a and pleasure. happy holidays. Thanks, you too. Uh, that's Dr. Paul Thomas uh, from Plum Health DPC, which is direct primary care. Uh, And when we return, we're going to hear from Dave Coulter, the Oakland County Executive, when caring for kids continues. Right here on the great voice of the Great Lakes, News Talk 760 WJR. Welcome back to Caring for Kids on WJR. Presented by the Children's Foundation. Once again, here's Larry Burns. And in the studio is none other than my former colleague, Dave Coulter. Uh, Dave is currently the Oakland County Executive, a position he was asked to take earlier this year, and he is doing a great job. Uh, In his first few weeks as County Executive, Dave worked with the Board of Commissioners to unanimously pass a balanced three-year budget that preserves Oakland County's fiscal strength and reflects core priorities. Prior to this role... As county executive, Dave was the director of external affairs for the Children's Foundation, and he also served as the mayor of Ferndale from 2011 to 2019. Dave is a native of Southeast Michigan, having grown up in St. Clair Shores, went to Bishop Gallagher. Indeed. Indeed you did. Uh, And he also received his bachelor's degree from Michigan State University. So, Dave, welcome to Caring for Kids. Larry, you know, it's great to be here. Thank you. (laughs) It's great to see you. And uh, we had some uh, great uh, few years working to uh, relaunch the Children's Foundation. And uh, you are and will be a big part of that. Thank you. So now, uh, in your new leadership role for several months, uh, and I'll just ask you, how's it going? (laughs) So it's going great. It really is. It's it's been a tremendous opportunity uh, that I've been given. I pinch myself every day that I'm that I'm in this role. As you know very well, it happened very quickly. Not a lot of transition time. I just sort of dove into it. Uh, but it's really going great. And the best part about it, and I think you can relate to this because you've been at the Children's Fund Foundation for about three years. Three years. Three now. years. Yep. And so when you get to be the new person who's driving transformational change versus just sort of doing what's been done or, or going through a merger or whatever, uh, when you actually get to lead uh, real change, uh, it's exciting. And, and so the work that I get to work on now and the things I get to do, uh, um, it really inspires me every day. And it reminds me a lot of, of the foundation in that we are transforming and we are changing. We're growing on a great history and foundation, but a lot of good new work. And right. so um, it's it's been a really exciting time. Excellent. Well, uh, we keep track of you and are very proud of you and uh, and know you're doing a great job. And so as we come to the end of a calendar year and uh, looking toward 2020, what are some of the things that 
you and your team uh, have um, as goals for uh, Oakland County in 2020? Yeah. Um, you know, I've really laid out sort of three things, one of which will be very familiar to you. But uh, the first one I'll talk about is uh, Oakland County is really the economic engine of Michigan. It's uh, It's got a GDP that's bigger than like 24 states. It's a very uh, economically successful county, and I want to make sure that we preserve that. So we're working in economic development to make sure we're attracting jobs and growing jobs and those sort of things. Um, the other thing is I want to be more of a regional partner um, with the other counties and, and the city of Detroit. Uh, I don't think Oakland County has always been perceived that way. And uh, I've joined a number of boards and have, have, have had quite a few meetings already with my counterparts in the region to make sure that Oakland County is doing things that lift up the whole region so that we can all be successful. But the third area that I want to talk about, mm-hmm. because this gets to a little bit about what we worked on together, is just uh, the health and wellness of the residents and particularly the children of Oakland County. Um, as we know, uh, there's the, the issues today are different than when we were growing right, up. Right. And we have a great health department. The health department reports to me, so I feel a real responsibility to make sure that we're doing everything there that we can. And I think we do a lot of really good things, um, and we do them well, but I'm there asking questions, some of which I learned in, in my time working with you, um, which is, why are there disparities from community to community? Um, are, is there, are there access to health care issues uh, that we need to address? Um, mental health, mental both, health, in, both yeah. in our, our, our adults and our children population, is so huge. And every time I bring this up, and I've go, I go all over the county, I talk to lots of different groups, and I bring up the issue of mental health and how it relates to so many of the other issues that we're facing, as you know very well, opioid addiction and and suicide and all of the other underlying issues have this mental health component to it. And everybody agrees that we're not doing enough as a county, as a state, as a country, really to address those issues. And I'm so glad that obviously your foundation does that. And we're going to focus more on that as well as a county. Absolutely. And uh, that's great to hear. We're talking with Dave Coulter, County Executive for Oakland County. Uh, and we're talking about some of his uh, priorities for 2020 uh, as it relates to uh, the county and what he and his team are going to work on. And so, you know, we mentioned that you were a key member of our Children's Foundation team. You and I had, if not hundreds, dozens of meetings around the state, particularly in Wayne, Oakland, and Macomb County. And mental health came up almost every time, right? It, it absolutely did. And it really led us to start funding uh, different programs. Uh, we, when we started, we really didn't have that much of a presence in Oakland County, but now we do. Uh, we now have 77 partners. If you recall, we had four when we started this journey. Now we have 77, and, and many of those are in Oakland County. And uh, uh, and so, um, you and what you're doing in Oakland County. I hope that the Children's Foundation can work with your team on on trying to address some of these issues. Well, I absolutely think there's an opportunity there, in part because you guys um, you know, focus on a wide range of things. You don't limit yourself to just one disease or one kind of preventative right. I- initiative. And so I think there's a lot of things that we can do together. Uh, I'm happy to hear you're into the 70s already. I think it was in the 40s when I left, so you've done yeah, a lot yeah, of work. it was 44, I think. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it was. Right. So you're doing a lot of good things. But what, but what was helpful about that, that time that you and I spent together meeting with all those groups is just learning the breadth and scope of the issues across our state and the similarities that exist across the state and across counties uh, and then the differences. But um, And then finding out that there really are organizations um, that do better than others and, and that are really making an impact in these areas. And I think you and I did a good job of identifying those nonprofit organizations that are really making an impact. Um, and those are the people that I want to replicate and copy yeah. from and yeah. learn from or bring to the table. Yeah, that's... Uh, that's well said. So your your time as mayor of Ferndale and then your time uh, at the Children's Foundation, can you point out to any of the things that those experience helped you as you launched into this bigger platform, bigger job uh, as the county executive? Um, 
Well, I think they've reiterated or reinforced for me sort of what's been my style and our style working together, certainly, which is to be collaborative, which Mm -hmm. is to say, you know, I don't have all the answers. Uh, I don't pretend to always be the smartest person in the room, but what I am good at is bringing smart people together, bringing the right people at the table and saying, what can we do together to work on these problems? It's what I did as the mayor of Ferndale. You know, I was really good at sort of community outreach. I think it's what we did at the the foundation uh, where we talk to, you know, providers that are doing this work and are in the trenches, especially around the mental health issues. And so it's that kind of a collaborative spirit that I've tried to bring to Oakland County, saying, hey, I don't know everything. I'm going to listen more than I talk, but we're going to get stuff done, and I'm going to do it with your help. Yeah, wow. So you recently announced that you plan on running for the uh, full term. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so I, I thought I'd ask you what your key messages are Uh, now and going to be to the uh, voters as you move forward. Yeah, well... um uh, you know, the, the slogan of the campaign is moving forward together, and it's just what I said, that we're yeah. all in this together. Right. We're in this together as a region. We're in this together as communities within the county. Um, I, I think when you put all the partisan desi- um, divide aside, uh, most people want the same things. They want good schools for our families. They mm-hmm. want good jobs for, you know, for our families. They want good health care yeah, right. and, and good, you know, um, wellness prevention, prevention programs. And so if we focus more on the things that we all agree that we want and then figure out in an honest way how to move there I, I think we'll be okay and that's the kind of executive I'm trying to be and that'll be a big part of the message next year excellent so uh, well thank you for being on caring for kids uh, we appreciate I know you're really busy busier than you've ever been probably but uh, it's it's great to have an opportunity to uh, to talk to you about what you've been doing and, and uh, what you hope to do in 2020 and beyond that so Dave well, Coulter Good luck, and uh, don't be a stranger. Uh, I'm thrilled to be back in the in the Fisher Building with you, Larry, and thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. That was Dave Coulter, Oakland County Executive. And coming up next, we're going to introduce you to this month's Little Champion and provide a little bit of information on the foundation, what's going on, when Caring for Kids continues on the great voice of the Great Lakes, News Talk 760 WJR. It's Caring for Kids with Larry Burns. This portion of Caring for Kids is dedicated to highlighting our little champion. Uh, The little champion program honors children who have overcome major obstacles in their young lives and continue to tackle these challenges with a smile each and every day. Meet this week's little champion, seven-year-old Ricky. Ricky has autism. He was also diagnosed with epilepsy and a heart murmur earlier this year. Despite all of this, he keeps a smile on his face and embodies the heart of a true champion. Congratulations, Ricky. For more information on the Little Champion program and how you can nominate a child, visit yourchildrensfoundation.org forward slash champion. As it relates to the foundation, we have our 8th annual Cheers for Children. That's going to take place on Saturday, January 25th at the fabulous State Savings Bank building in downtown Detroit. Party starts at 8, so don't miss it. Uh, And I want to thank you all for listening to Caring for Kids throughout the year. This is our December show, so it'll be the last show for 2019. So thank you. Our Children's Foundation is proud to sponsor this program. And we look forward to an even better 2020. So happy holidays and happy new year. We'll see you next year. Caring for Kids with Larry Burns on WJR has been presented by the Children's Foundation.